Philly will always rock. 94 WISP. Well, it is actually happening. Uh, I told you Howard Stern was calling, and uh, Howard Stern. Dude, I have worked here uh, since I was 20 years old. I'm 35 now. Wow. And the first day I talked to Howard is <laughs> it's on the Thanks, last Mike. day. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, you're on vacation now, right? I'm on vacation. 15 years you're there. 15, well, yeah, I, you, Tim was my, uh, my original boss here, Mr. Tim Sabian. Now, what is your game plan? I mean, you know, when, when you think about the death of a radio station, we're, of course, talking about people. And, uh, what, so what do you do? Well, I mean, I think my first, you know, what I do here is I'm the system program director and I introduce songs. But, right. but as a, uh, a 35-year-old radio personality who has more, I think, more to, to give the world than introducing songs, I think it, it comes at a, personally, a really good time for me. Because when you're, you're making good money and you're doing something you're good at, sometimes it's hard to pull away right. to do something you need to do. So, um, now, do you but, have something lined up? Not a job, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, for years, I've been giving everything I do, every podcast, everything I wrote just goes to somebody else. So now I'm going to do it for myself. And I'm going to take this time next couple of months start a uh, I have a website built like spikeeskin.com and I'll podcast every day and be able to to talk and do and write um, and be able to do the things that I not play music but actually right. talk. Right, right. And well, that I, sounds good. Yeah, it sounds like fun. And and I the only music that Did I've you make some dough doing that or what? Well, I don't need to right away. I right. mean, I think I'd like to figure out how much I like doing that. Now, has the company taken care of you guys, especially if you've been there 15 years? I mean, or do they just cut you loose? Well, they've taken care of me. I mean, I did. I left for a year and a half to go work in Chicago, and if I had stayed that whole time, the taking care of me would have been a little bit better, but it's certainly good. It's good enough. So, now, What about Jeff, the program director? Is he going to be all right? Yeah, he's, he's staying on. He's going to work at uh, the new 94 WIP. I see. Okay, so... Yeah. Uh, so, so um, now today is the last day you play music. Yeah, and at, at three o'clock today is the the last. You know that'll be the very end of ninety four WISP. Well, I'll tell you, I feel, um, you know, on the one hand, I feel kind of good that, uh, in terms of like mornings and the ratings and all of that, that uh, you know Philadelphia was so good to me. I love WISP. It's very it's very strange to hear that WISP is not going to be there anymore because. You know, I had dreams of being on the radio when I, since I was five years old. But then when I, be, when I went to college and I dreamt of being on the radio, there were certain radio stations that were legendary, like WBCN in Boston, which is no longer music, and WISP and, uh, you know, WPLJ in New York and, and NEW and all this, and MMR. These were, these were, this was like my dream. If I could one day work at WISP, it would be... Nirvana. I mean, I couldn't even imagine when I was starting in radio. And I even knew, I didn't know anything about Philadelphia, but even as a kid, I knew Bala Kenwood because I knew that was the address <laughs> for WISP. I used to look it up and say, one day I'm going to send a tape there. You even say it the right way. Did I say it the right yeah, way? Yeah, Bala Kenwood. Yeah, yeah. and, I, and I, uh, that's because Kid Chris coached me before. I, uh, <laughs> you, by the way, I should mention Kid Chris. He called me about an hour ago. Yeah, Kid Chris and I are friends. And he said to me, you know, there's a website, and he goes, guess who they don't mention on their website? <laughs> he told me. WISP. I said, who, me? I figured me. I don't know. I'm always the enemy. And uh, he said, no, not you. He goes, you're all over it. He goes, they don't even mention my name that I was on the air there. So I said, well, I'll mention your name that you were on the air. <laughs> So well, he, think that's all about. Well, you know, you know, Chris takes a little bit of pride in the fact that he doesn't get mentioned. Chris likes being the enemy a little bit too. Yeah, I think he was hurt, and then he was also honored. Yeah. So he he just called me to. He's in Atlanta now. But I, you know, getting back to this point about WISP, this like like these were radio stations that, as a as a young broadcaster, I can only dream of being on. And these this was my lofty goal to get on WYSP, even more so than WMMR. And I don't I think WMMR was more uh like a you know serious rock music station and YSP represented to me more of a uh album rock kind of thing at the time and it seemed like a place where I could fit in and all I dreamt about was playing the music and 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 maybe getting on and and having like a little air shift or something but uh, that was out of my reach, but that was something I aspired to. And now these radio stations won't be there anymore. And on the one hand, I'm very grateful to Philadelphia because, you know, a lot of people used to say, oh, you know, if you just get on the air and talk, you could have Howard's ratings. And and uh, it turns out that Philadelphia really responded to my morning show. And, and you know how grateful I am for that because that started me on my syndication road and enabled me to be heard throughout the country and, and certainly expanded my career. So Philadelphia was great for me. WISP was great for me. 
And uh, it was such an honor to broadcast on WYSP, to be a part of it. I can't tell you how it excited me when we first got on there, and, and, and even all the years later when we hit number one. Uh, they, these were huge milestones in my life. I even keep a little calendar, and, and on it are the dates that when we hit number one at YSP in Philadelphia. And it reminds me every year that, like, wow, that was a, that was a big time in my life. So I, I say this, I hate to see it go, but uh, at the same time, I kind of feel really honored that Philadelphia not only loved my morning show, but kind of didn't love the all the morning shows that came afterwards. You know, it was like we we really sent the set the benchmark, and uh, it, it, it's pretty heady stuff for me, you know, to think that Philadelphia was so loyal. Well, I mean, that's that's what Philadelphia is about. I think it's funny you bring up Chris because what I told about Chris when he came here, uh, in reference to you, is once they, once Philadelphia decides they love you, they will love you like nobody else loves you. And that was kind of I know your show was broadcast from New York, but it felt like we Philadelphia loved Howard more than anybody else loved Howard. Like I felt we were more dedicated to you than anybody else ever was, and that's why. Yeah, the fans were great. I remember when I came for um, um, a book signing, and there were like 25,000 people there uh, waiting in line for me. I waited in that line, man. Yeah, and I, and yeah. I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to sit here. I think I sat there for 10 hours. I said, there's no way I'm turning away a fan because Philadelphia's just been incredible. And, and this whole WYSP and Philadelphia radio market, I remember when I was a broadcaster in Detroit, and things weren't going really well for me. And I actually worked with a guy who was a, I think he was a, an MMM, MMR guy as opposed to a YSP guy, but his name was John Bloodwell, and he was a promotions director. And uh, John was just so in love with Philadelphia, and he used to tell me the stories of working for Jeff Pollock and Dick Hungate and how they, you know, they, they, you know, there's so much work that goes into these rock stations, and the and the history of these rock stations, and the and the love affair that the people who work there have with it, it's, and the fans who love it, it's, it's very weird to me that BCN is gone, YSP is gone, you know, K-Rock is gone. It's, uh, it's very strange, but I guess that kind of points out to what the future of radio is going to be. I think most people want to hear music uninterrupted from commercials, and I think that's, you know, maybe FM will become more of a talk format. And, uh, you know, that's why I went to Satellite. I mean, you know, that, that's the thing with the music. I'm used to hearing music now without commercials. So maybe that's also part of the problem. Who knows what it is? But it is sad because I, I wonder, like, where other broadcasters are going to get that kind of experience and, and get that kind of work. Well, do you think that if, if the FM band becomes more of that, do you think there are enough people, enough talented people to fill up uh, a full band of of people talking like I've, I've always thought that the worst thing that's happened in radio the last several years is that people that are talented enough to do that started doing other things you know that radio really wasn't the place for them anymore and it's hard for me to to comprehend it's hard enough to find one morning show much less a station full of people talented enough to just talk that whole time well do i think the perception uh, you're right the, the perception of of uh, radio executives is that oh we'll just get some you know, some guy on who's got a, a radio background, and we'll put him on the air, and he'll talk, and everyone will follow. And it's not that. The art of conversation and, and the art of being funny and and really putting energy and effort into your show and thinking about what it is you're doing, it's tremendously exhausting, and it, 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 it takes a lot of years of practice before you get really good at it. And I, I guess I kind of resent this attitude that, oh, we'll just throw a guy on, and uh, we'll put them on the air. We'll take a comedian and stick them on the air. No, it, radio guys are very unique, and you need to go through a long, long process, hours and hours of uh, honing your, your craft and honing your skills and really pulling it together. And it is hard to find guys who can do a morning show now because they don't, you know, most companies don't even want to put up with any nonsense or they don't take any risks. You know, I mean, look at look at my own career. It, it became so oppressive. The 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 government, the situation with uh, with uh, you, you know the FCC, all of that was such a nightmare, and you had to put up with so much. And and it, it just becomes fatiguing. And, it, and you start to, as a creative person, go, I don't even know that this is the right venue for me. I don't know if I should be on the radio. Uh, it's too oppressive. You know, every time you try to make a joke, it's so damn serious that everyone gets all offended and stuff. So, 
It's a very complicated thing, and, and that's why I think you see the end of YSP. There isn't a farm team, so to speak, where people come up and, you know, and, and, and it's not like there's a pool of people to choose from who are good at the radio. And, but there are many talented people in radio. A lot of them are driven out. A lot of them just can't make a living. It's very difficult nowadays. Do you think the pendulum eventually, you talked about, you know, the, the, um, the censorship that you had to go through, which got, you know, after everybody points to the Janet Jackson incident, is after that it got crazier. Do you think the pendulum eventually has to swing back? If It swung so far that way. Do you think eventually that it's got to go back the other way and it's got to loosen up? I mean, but, you know, corporations, listen, you can understand why corporations and radio companies are afraid of the FCC. The FCC licenses, you know, that they can take away a license. And so they shake in their pants, and they don't want to go up against the government, and they don't want to say to the government, what you're doing is uh, not correct here, that it's a free marketplace, and what are you so uptight about? I mean, mean, if you remember, I I first got fined because I talked about a guy playing the piano with his penis. I mean, it sounds ridiculous now. And and, uh, it's just unthinkable that corporations have to buckle to this kind of pressure, but I understand that there's a lot of money on the line. These radio licenses are worth a lot of money. So I don't know what's going to be. It's just kind of sad. Hey, I want to mention a guy who used to be on in Philadelphia radio, Mark Drucker. He died. But yeah, Mark the Shark. Work with, I worked with him, uh, Mark the Shark, I worked with him a long time ago. Uh, he was a real nice guy. And uh, I'm thinking about all these guys who came out of Philadelphia. That's what I'm thinking about today. And uh, I'm sure they're all kind of the, the ones that are still around and going, man, this is really weird that the, these stations don't exist. But, you know, I guess it's progress. Who knows? We had Pam Murley in uh, early in the week, and one of the— she I did, remember her. Yeah, and she did a um, she did an hour on the air, and one of the things she was most excited to talk about, she played a clip of it, was that she got to interview you on the air, and she said that Tim told her it would only be four or five minutes, and we played the clip of you you just telling her what a big fan you were and that you used to think about her and listen to her while you were alone. It was the funniest thing I've ever heard. I did heard. when I was in high school. I used to listen to her on WLIR radio. That's funny and uh yeah she had a really sexy voice i never actually saw what she looked like or anything but i, I had a lot of fantasies that's <laughs> you know that's what's so cool i mean i'm in love with radio i've always been in love with radio and i can't imagine that love ever going away i i always was fascinated by the guys who sat there and played records or spoke on the radio and um you know i truly i truly love the medium and all of this change is is really it's so, I'm nostalgic about a station like WYSP. I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that it's not going to be there. But, uh, you know, I guess it just points out that people are getting their music from other places now. And Right? I mean, isn't that, the, well, isn't that what's going on? I think rock music especially, what's happened is, is that the, the Internet has opened up the avenue for people to know about so many different new rock bands that it's hard to get people all liking the same thing at the same time. And and when you program a music radio station that um, that has to appeal to lots and lots of people and everybody has the option to hear what they want when they want specifically to, to build any kind of consensus on what you know a bunch of people want to hear at once becomes really, really difficult. And then like you said with, with commercials is people right. they have the they have ways to listen to music that is uninterrupted and is exactly what they want. And so you see my dilemma? Should yeah. I be happy or should I be sad today that YSP is going away? I'm happy in the sense that a lot of people are saying, well, when Howard was there, he held the radio station together and held it up. And, and because of the massive morning audience, it kept the whole thing going. And then on the other hand, as a fan of radio and someone who's nostalgic for the whole WYSP thing and what it meant to me, I'm sort of sad. But then again, I think I might have been even more hurt if some morning show came in and was super successful and everyone forgot about me. So I have trouble deciding whether I'm happy or sad. But I think, I think I'm sad. <laughs> I, I miss the idea of WISP being there. Well, it, for me, I see, I choose to be both. And this has been my whole adult life I've been here. I mean, WISP started for me when I was 14 and listening to Howard Stern uh, on the way to school when right. I shouldn't have been on the bus. Um, and by the way, what's, what's funny for me talking to you is that my dad, do you remember when John DeBella, after the morning zoo, teamed up with a sports guy to take on you? Right. My dad is that sports guy. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so when I'm, I'm you know, 14, 15 years old and 
listening to Howard Stern, my dad is teaming up with DeBella to go against Howard Stern. So not only did I kind of hide the fact that I was listening to Stern in the first place because, you know, it was uh, risque as it was, but like my dad was the competition. So I, everything, um, everything that I've learned about being on the radio is him. And, and you, which is an interesting, you know, clash for me. But the first I ever learned about WISP was Howard Stern. And I choose to, and I'm, so I'm struggling with the same happy, sad thing because I'm happy to be able to take a week and talk about everything great that has ever happened here. And it, you know, between you and, and everybody that's ever been here and every great moment that we've had. And I'm sad that it won't be here, but what you talked about to me that, that hits home the most is I will miss the idea of WISP and the, uh, the notion of it more than the actual building. You know, the, just the notion of W. It's like Santa Claus. Yeah, I don't think I've ever actually been in WISP. Well, I've I don't never think seen I've ever it. actually visited the, the, the station. I don't think I did. If I did, I don't remember, but my memory's shot anyway, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it really, it really, truly is. But uh, well, you, you were know, you were outside, right, for the the um, the, the funeral. funeral. Yeah, yeah. I think back on the funeral. You know, you know. Now, now, when I look back in retrospect, first of all, um, you know that whole thing with John DeBella, I have uh, strange feelings about because I don't, I, I don't dislike John DeBella. I think John DeBella is a very nice guy, and I and I look back on that, and I think I was a bit insane because I think I could have functioned and done that morning show and not ever had to really mention w, uh, WMMR and, and the morning zoo. I think the whole thing generated for me, I was very caught up in radio wars and I was very hungry to succeed because this was our first syndication market out of New York. And I really wanted to be successful in Philly. And I was an angry young man, you know? And when I think back on it, the, 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 the notion that I was more upset about was this morning zoo concept I hated morning zoos. I thought morning zoos were everything that was wrong with radio. And now I kind of philosophically look back on it and I go, well, what's wrong with a morning zoo if some people like that? You know, it's fine. I mean, there probably was room for a morning zoo and for me. But at the time, I couldn't see anybody listening to a morning zoo. I couldn't tolerate that kind of radio. And quite frankly, I'd never even heard John DeBell. I didn't know what the show was. I, I didn't know much about it except from what, what people told me. So I really have no dislike for John, and and uh, I know I sounded like I was insane and frothing at the mouth because I was insane and frothing at the mouth. But, uh, you know, I don't, um, you know, in a way, I, I kind of have a lot of respect for John and anybody who worked in the Philadelphia market. And I don't really feel badly, or and I'm not sure even where all my crazy anger came from. <laughs> I think I think more, more of my anger wasn't really about John, because I didn't know John, and I didn't know his show. I, my anger was more about, uh, I was frustrated and angry that more people couldn't get my radio show, and I was really angry that I was just a local New York performer, and I wanted to be on across the country. And I probably took it out on everyone in my past. And... Um, I think John actually uh, handled himself with a lot of class and and just kind of like was like oh my god what what is this storm coming my way and why why is this guy you know going berserk but uh, I I don't dislike John at all and and I have respect for him. Well, when that worked, it almost because I remember listening to it. It was funny because I actually worked with uh, Mancal for a brief time too. But I remember when you went after Mancal and then was it Mark and Brian in right. L A. and I just remember hearing what. I'll tell you, maybe you could do it a different way, but it was certainly interesting yeah, I mean, that's uh, the way you were was, doing and it. And you know what? I, I still have that anger, and sometimes, I mean, when I'm on the air at Sirius, by the way, I'm still, I'm still around. I'm on Sirius Satellite Radio, for those of you who don't know. And uh, I suggest you, you know, listen to me <laughs> every day. And for God's sakes, come over and listen. I'm entitled to a commercial. Absolutely. Right? I know on terrestrial radio, they get well, crazy when I mention satellite, but terrestrial radio hasn't gone anywhere. They, they're doing just fine. They let you do it for a year. You, uh, might, you yeah. can get five seconds of it during my show. So, yeah, absolutely. But, but you're right. Uh, like uh, uh, Mark and Brian, for example, um, I was angry with them. You know, I just had this, I had this intense rage because I was angry with them because I felt that they were doing a lot of what I was doing. But getting noticed by the Hollywood community and getting all these great opportunities, and I was like, that that, that just didn't sit well with me. And Man Cow, I, I I just disliked him. I disliked I, I disliked uh, what he you know. Well, he's I, a phony. Is, is that I, you know? Yeah. I don't really know him all that well either. But I just know I, I somehow got into it with him, and 
I got into it with all these guys. And a lot of it was genuine. Don't get me wrong. I was genuinely enraged. I, I never went on the air and was a phony. Or, or, But I'm not sure what the hell all that rage was about. I don't think it was about the, the individual person like John DeBello or Mark and Brian. I think it was more about my rage, about the radio industry, and about how slow it was at, at, at keeping up with me in terms of wanting to syndicate. It was infuriating to me that I wasn't on in every market in the country. It goes on in television all the time. Why couldn't it go on radio? And now we're quite used to it. We're, we're used to seeing people being syndicated. They see that there's a lot of money in it. But boy, oh boy, when I wanted to do it, everyone fought it tooth and nail. They really did. Well, I'll tell you what I related to, as, and I, I don't know that this is where it came from, but as a teenager, as a as a um you know a, a teenage guy that wasn't popular you build up a lot of rage as you get older and it right. takes a while and different ways for you to kind of release it and some people did it like i listened to heavy metal when i was you know in my teens and 20s and it felt for me the the reason that i related related to it is that you were taking down the popular kids that that didn't deserve to be popular and that's where i thought it was cool because you felt i felt like you were fighting for me like you were an underdog you were a regular guy and that's where um, that's where my anger came from as a kid, and that's what I heard in you um, when I yeah, heard you do that. A lot of people responded to that anger, and, and believe me, I still have it. I'm, I'm in the psychiatrist's office three days a week trying to <laughs> calm that rage down. I don't know how people do it, but uh, I, I just I just get that intense anger sometimes. And, and because I am passionate about radio, and the fact that I love it so much, I can I can just get you know worked up over the littlest thing in radio. So you know. Uh, you know, my temper came out on the air, and and it made for good radio. I knew that, but sometimes it would just like take it would just take up so much of my energy. You know, all that rage. Um, but man, those were exciting days. YSP and getting on the air there. I can't tell you how jacked I was, and perhaps it was the the, the highlight of my radio career, getting on in a new market and having the ability to reach into Philadelphia, and with the promise that if I did well there, that it would happen in other parts of the country. It was I was on fire and and nothing would stop me and nothing would slow me down, and I. Um, Do you remember finding out how you found out what the the process was of getting on here? Do you remember a moment finding out you're you're going to be on a show? Yeah, I kind of do. I, I um, you know, it's all a little bit hazy and foggy. I know Andy Bloom seems to have his take on it. I, I, I love Andy, and Andy is a huge part of the success. He did a great job of integrating our show in with the rest of the station, as did Tim Sabian, who works with me now at Sirius. Um, and Andy and Tim, but you know, the, the way I remember it is, I, I when I got on the air at NBC Radio in New York in, in 1981 or something like that, I my my biggest ambition. I went to the bosses at NBC every day and said, you know, you've got this network. Why can't you put me on the network? Well, we can't put you on. You're local. You're New York. You're so New York. I go, no, I'm not. I worked in Washington. I was number one. I I worked in Hartford. I worked in Detroit. What is it? Why? What is it about New York that you think is so local? I don't talk about the local high schools or the local game. I don't care about that stuff. It's a national show. And they would fight me on a tooth and nail. They go, "Well, we'll give you a five-minute uh, little blip you can do, and uh, we'll take a portion of your show." I go, "No, just put my whole stupid show on and let whoever wants to run it play it." And they would fight me on it. So then, when I got to K Rock in New York, I began this droning, nagging, whining uh, way that I have with um, you know Mel and said, please put me on in Philadelphia. I can make you guys some money. We could be a number one show. No, it's too local. It's local. Everyone would local, local, local. And so I nagged and nagged and nagged, and uh, I don't know, somehow, finally I got my way. And and then when I was told I could do it, I was, it, it was like a, it was like I was beginning all over again. Like, this was it. And in fact, I, that even added to my rage. I went, oh, no, the people in Philadelphia don't even know what I've been doing. I have to go explain myself. And and for them, it's like I'm starting over day one. And every time we started in a new market, it was like starting over day one. And it, and the whole process was rather frustrating because I was like, why can't they just turn on a switch and let me be heard all over the country so that everyone would be up to speed with the show? But Philly was, you know... Philly was the start of a lot, and uh, yeah, Andy Bloom was there, and Andy did a great job, and um, uh, who else was there? I, I mean, there were so many people involved with it, but, you know, it was really a, a great highlight in my life. So, you know, goodbye WISP, and, and goodbye to um, 
all the fans. The fans, I just want to address, and the reason I called in today was to say how incredibly loyal you've been to me. For those of you who haven't followed us over to Syria, shame on you. <laughs> but uh, there's still time. We've, uh, we're on for another five years, so would love to see you over there. And, and, and quite frankly, I'm uh, very, very uh, attached with the audience in Philadelphia. I feel very, very emotionally connected to that audience because they did support me. And when I came there for the, um, you know, when we turned number one for the funeral and when I came there for book signings, Philadelphia just uh, was way behind me. And YSP was a great, great opportunity for me. So for all you guys who are still working at YSP, I'm sorry you're losing your jobs. If I was there, you wouldn't be losing your jobs. (laughs) Let's let's remember that. And to all the guys like uh, Kid Chris and uh, everyone else who's been sort of, you know, holding down the ship for those guys who came uh, and left. And, uh, you know, this is a great tradition. And I think any of us who have worked at WISP should be really proud of ourselves because, you know what, we poured our heart and soul into it. And, and a lot of times, like you say, the physical building means nothing, which is true. It means nothing. But what we, our energies, and, the, and, and I devoted so many years to that station. And, um, you know, I will miss it. And I, and I, I love the people of Philadelphia for making uh, such a great opportunity for me to work, you know. So I know how frustrating it is when it doesn't work, and I, and I, and I feel your frustration. But, uh, you know, hey, WISP, we'll all say it. I'm going to have cocktails tonight and toast uh, WISP. Well, it's, it's been an honor to, to talk to you. I promised Jeff that I would not talk too much about this, but we've been singing in the halls for two days. Um, do you remember the words to the Beetlejuice song? Uh, this is Beetle, I'm as bad as can. And he knows. And he knows. He's the best. He's the best. There we go. <laughs> uh, and and, and what, 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 what better song is there? Maybe, None. maybe that should be the last song played on WISP. We had joked that, uh, I was joking with Jeff, that I was going to stand at the board and everyone would think it was one song and I was going to hit the Beatles song and stand here with a knife <laughs> and dare people to take it off the air. That well, uh, you got to do it. <laughs> what, what is, is there a planned last song? There is. is. Like, like Leonard Skinner's, uh, you know, I don't know, Freebird or something? And Andy would kill me if I to- if I said the song on the air. Oh, you mean you guys have worked it all out? Yeah, but yeah. Why can't it be? You know, listen. Who defined uh, WISP more than Beetlejuice? The Beetlejuice. I mean, I mean, here we had the number one show for years and years. Andy knows this better than anyone. <laughs> and Andy, you know, Andy's had an illustrious radio career aside from working for the um, for Nixon or whoever the hell he worked for. Who did he work for again? <laughs> he, he worked George Bush or something. Yeah, some Republican. Know. Yeah. yeah. He, 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 yeah. yeah, but anyway, um, well, why not Beetlejuice? Well, I'll tell you what. If I can't convince them to, do, I get my my show ends at two, and then there's one more hour that's kind of a group hour. But I can promise you, who's that doing the last hour? All of us. All we're, of us. We're all going to be here together. But my, gang bang. But yes, but in my in my who's final, all of us, by what, the way? what's that? Everyone who works here now, um, like all of the employees and anyone who has come back to do alumni things, they're also invited to be uh, in here as yeah, well. We'll compliment uh, Viacom for allowing you guys to do final shows. I mean, usually they just pull the plug. I, I had this happen to me when I worked in Detroit. They went country, and they just pulled a bus in in the middle of the night with new records and threw us all out, you know. They gave us two weeks. I've had two weeks to do farewell shows. I, I almost don't even have anything left to say. I wonder if the ratings are going up just because of the... And who's doing mornings, Danny? Danny, uh, yeah, Danny actually had a planned uh, off week this week. So yeah, oh. he had done he had done mornings up until last Friday. Were they afraid that Danny would go berserk or something on the air? Is that why they didn't really want him doing the last week? What's the real story? Who would be afraid of Danny going berserk? I don't know. That's crazy. That a good radio. Yeah. <laughs> no, he he was going to do. I think he was doing a cruise. He had a cruise okay. for Triple A that was a big sponsored thing, and he was already scheduled to be on it. So so that's why he's not there. I don't think they're afraid of Danny. Danny is very. Danny is scary from afar, but up close you realize that Danny, Danny just you know wants to work and do now, his job. So. Yeah, of course. Is MMR still going to be a rock station? Yeah, yeah. So there's only one rock station in Philly. Well, there's uh, like an alternative station. Um, there's a rock oh. station. There's like a classic hits kind of station as well. So uh, what the hell happened with you guys? Why do you why did why do you let things fall apart like this? Well, I got to be honest with you. It, it fell like you know very well that for a few years with Free FM, it fell apart. It did fall apart. Um, but for right. the last few years, we have actually um, done pretty well for 
for ourselves. Oh. Um, but the um, the sports station is on AM. I see. And there are not a ton of younger people um, that listen to AM anymore. Right. And there is more there's more revenue possibility for a sports station on FM than for us. So I think it was a little bit less about our our lack of success and a little bit more about opportunity. You for feel them. like MMR's cheering like like wow we got rid of WISP because that was the famous rivalry. Yeah. Well, I think they are cheering somewhere, yeah. but th- somewhere else well, they probably. Know. I'll tell you why because I know um, a lot of guys I knew who were at MMR. They would always take comfort in feeling like, oh wow, if if they fire me at MMR, I could always go across the street to YSP. Yeah, yes. So I mean, it's not good for guys who are doing you know rock radio. No, there's fewer um, jobs. There's fewer and fewer jobs, but the, the strong will survive. Now, um, do you think I'm looking like a hero today? Because when I was there, everything was so strong. Well, you always look like a hero, okay, Howard. Okay. As long yeah. as I come out looking good. <laughs> Always. Writing an article about how good I'm looking? Yeah. (laughs) Quickly, write that article. (laughs) Well, anyway, uh, it's really been good talking to you. You too. I'm going to go stare at the wall for my radio show. And and that's what I do. And uh, (laughs) and, uh, I just want to say thank you again to Philadelphia, okay? And thank you too, Howard. All right, later. All right. Well, that was just about the coolest thing that ever happened to me. It took it took a very long time. I expected that. Okay, so they tell you Howard's going to call, um, and um, you don't know what it's going to be. The first thing for me is I don't know if he's going to call at all because it wouldn't be the first time that they told me, like, a rock star was going to call and somebody forgot. So not only does he – and then when I, when I think he's going to call, I don't know. Maybe it's going to be two minutes. Maybe he's going to say thanks and just kind of move on. So not only does he call, he calls three minutes early. He asks me how I'm doing, what my plan are and then proceeds to do a uh, half an hour on WISP with me and for somebody who has uh, like I said been here for a very very long time uh, the first time I get to talk to Howard is kind of on a, a sad day but it was a thrill for me and um, thank you to Howard Stern thanks to Tim Sabian who uh, allowed me to work here when I was much younger and much less experienced uh, and much more of a hothead um, and uh, he, is, he is Howard's boss now so thanks to Tim for making it happen thank you to Howard Billy will always rock. 94 WISP.